So let me ask you, how many of you think that EBM is something new? Can we have raise of hands? How many of you think EBM is new? It's not a catch question. Come on, say yes or say no. How many of you say yes? Nobody? So everybody is the no category. Ah, there is no maybe. <laughs> okay. So what I'm trying to say is we are all prejudiced. So we have a lot of influences in our lives, a lot of information or data that we have prejudice us towards seeing what actually is. So the talk is about whether EBM is suffering from the same disease or we are not able to see it or perceive it as it is. Evidence-based medicine, 1990. That is where it originated. Gordon Guyard in 1990 coined the term accidentally in application on some med internal medicine residency program. So it was an accidental discovery. But then, before 1990, were we practicing non-evidence-based medicine? We were always practicing evidence-based medicine. If you look at history, there were case studies where careful men noted what are generally answered better and then began same for their patients. So that's what the doctor's profession is and has been always. The observational studies has been always there. We carefully observe, clearly recorded description and deductive reasoning. This has served us well till 1900 years. So what happened suddenly? This approach cannot establish causality. So we had issue of whether there is a causal relationship between the disease and the organism or whatever incidence is. The confounding variables affected our decisions and there was huge variability. Most of the doctors were working in isolation. So there were a lot of personal biases. And this is a special case where we try to fit in the explanation according to our perception or our prejudice. So that was the main thing that was against what was being followed for 1900. So there was a need to address this issue. But was EBM the first attempt? No. This was done, started in 1830 by this French gentleman. And then he introduced the numerical theory and clinical epidemiology. Biostatistics came in. The randomization procedure was first done by Fisher in 1920 and successful trial was conducted in 1931. Bradford Hill is the father of RCT who has conducted so many of them and of course Cochrane. These were established branch before EBM came into play. So these were already established and the concept of bias was clearly there. All the methodology, the randomized trial, non-randomized trial, Cohort are always established. So what did EBM add? So what did EBM add to all, all of these? These are already existing. So what was new then? It added a framework and rules to utilize evidence in a systematic manner. That is what it added. So what's new? Sorry. The definition. Conscientious use of current best evidence from healthcare research in making healthcare decisions. The hierarchy was proposed, the evidence cycle of us acquire, appraise, and apply, and act was proposed. It was declared as a paradigm shift, and there was huge propaganda. This was happening in early 1990s. There were a lot of positive as well as negative propaganda. So a lot of people were considering this as the best discovery of medicine in the last century, while others were criticizing it completely. Let's see some of the criticism that were put forth. EBM is an epidemiological tool. So we can study an entire population, but individual patients is unreliable. People are not statistical programs that will behave identically. We are complex individual and behave differently. The current model says that it will combine clinical circumstances, patient preferences with research evidence and clinical expertise. But it doesn't give any framework to how to marry all these three together. There is even today there is no framework of how to bring together patient preferences. For example, how can EBM add the patient dislikes Elizabeth ring to a blinded, double blinded, randomized design? It cannot. And then the problem of statistics. 
lies, dam lies and shadow snakes. So it can be used both ways. I spoke earlier on good use of it, but data can be used in any ways. For example, this is the white swan problem, a common perception. So in early days, uh, in the Western world, most of the swans were white. So people consider that swans are always white. Then suddenly down in Australia, they found a white swan. Now what to do? So should the proposition that all swans are white be rejected? And would this black swan be given a place in the uh, reality? That is what is p-value. So what p-value says is less than 0 0.05 means if there are less than five black swans, you can consider that all swans are white. Will you consider that in real, real world? That's not possible. So true, false, and then there is statistics. And of course, there is fragility of p-value. So population 200, p-value less than 0 0.05 for a difference of 10. I increase the population, decrease the difference, popula and p-value is still less than 0 0.05. The large sample, I'm increasing the sample size, and you see for the difference, the p-value is still significant. Decreasing difference and increasing population. Large sample, small effects become relevant. Sufficiently large sample, you can prove anything to be statistically significant. That's the flaw of large multi-center studies. That's called the fragility of p-value. Again, same thing, population 200, p-value is not significant. So they'll tell you it's underpowered. What do you do? Increase the sample, 400. P-value becomes significant, 800. P-value becomes significant for a lesser value. So the same thing, you adjust the samples, you adjust the difference, and you get P-value significant. This has been happening very commonly with a lot of publications that have been rated high-level evidence-based publications. Sufficiently large sample can show even small difference as statistically significant. And that's what all about sample size calculation. You can, before the study, manipulate your sample size so that at the end of the study you get p-value significant. So that's always possible. These are, mind you, criticism of EBM. EBM is unsure. It denotes best evidence as hierarchy, meta-analysis, grades, uh, hierarchy is the rock on which EBM is built, and since it is since its inception, there are more than 20 revisions of this hierarchy, and the current version is not been. I mean, there is no consensus which one is the current one. Grading is completely detached from scientific lo logic. It's, it's based only on the uh, statistics, and the variations of grades are very very anomalous. There is no field of inquiry other than clinical medicine that tries to grade itself. I mean, no other field of science will try to grade it except clinical medicines and EBM. EBM proves that it itself is unsound. The fundamental assumption of EBM is that physician who practice EBM will provide superior care, isn't it? But there is no RCT to say that. 25 years now, and they have not conducted a single study to say that their assumption is true. Again, article can be pre-graded. They'll tell you this is level one, RCT. So you're going to judge the book but just by the cover of it. You're not going to go into detail and read whether it is really RCT level one or so. And then there are conflicting RCTs. I mean, there are RCTs all over the place that will give you conflicting results, completely opposite to that. What one study says, something other says, there is no difference, there is negative impact, things like that. And then if RCT is level one, how many RCTs do we need to answer one question? And then how many meta-analysis of RCT and meta-meta-analysis of systematic review? I mean, it just goes on and on, doesn't stop anywhere. And then harmful EBM. For example, this study of BMP, which was graded as very good and grade one study, based on which this got FDA approval. And after some time, we could see all the complications of BMP in spine. EBM founder says that clinical decisions should be based on empirical evidence and that expert opinion is untrustworthy. You know what this quote is based on? It's based on expert opinion by the EBM. Again, is there a middle ground? RCT versus observational studies. Of course there is. So systematic reviews, 
and meta analysis of non randomized study can give you equally good results and good quality of conclusions so there is this overlapping stage here between rcts and non rcts where if you conduct your observational studies correctly you'll get good and valid results so there is always a tussle between clinicians and ebm even now this is very similar to what happens in 1930 when microbiology evolved so a clinician thought that microbiologists will now diagnose and treat every disease same is the state today clinician think that ebm will give all guidelines and we have to follow them that's not the thing current state of ebm government can make policy decisions drug companies can use it malpractice attorney of course can use it use in consulting room difficult to assess individual patient treatment it may be informed by the evidence so informed personal opinion is still the valid thing for individual patient again the model has to be changed a bit patient preferences have to be taken into account clinical circumstances have to be taken into account there is a model which is circle of evidence that has been proposed rather than the hierarchy of evidence i think we are moving towards that where all evidence is at equal level and there is no hierarchy whatever is useful for your patient you can apply and take it ahead so the pendulum is shifting in 70s it was authority and 90s came the ebm and now there is somewhere in middle that we are approaching so research research methods are not mutually exclusive but they are complementary is ebm new conceptually yes but it's still evolving there much time left for it to evolve for example here plato and aristotle plato is pointing towards theoretical basis of knowledge while aristotle is pointing towards practical aspect so wise clinicians will use both so we'll use our expertise as well as ebm to make our own decisions so these are few articles that are uh, on on the present concept thank you